Hello everyone. Good evening. I hope all of you are doing well and uh, thank you for joining into this session. I am Dr. Vaishnavi and I am your ENT educator on the Prep Ladder platform. If all is going well, if you are able to hear me and if the video stream is fine, do play, tell me in the chat box below so that I have a quick confirmation before we start the session. Hello everyone. Yes, so everything is working well. Okay, so I think so everything is going well because uh, I see there is a confirmation and uh, first of all, good evening to all of you. And uh, today's session is basically going to be a session where we're going to discuss the last resort revision for your prof examination. Having said that, we have an entire uh, subject of ENT which comprises of otology, rhinology, larynx, pharynx, head and neck. And you can have any sorts of questions coming in from this particular uh, subject into your final exams. So the goal of this session is going to be basically to orient you to the most important university exam question. So we are going to take the pattern which has been asked in the university exams. Unlike just through running through the topics, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take long essays. I'm going to take short essays and we're going to discuss those long and short essays so that you're going to have an idea of how to represent your answers in the exam. You're going to get an understanding about, uh, you know, what sort of questions can be asked. And these are all the questions which have been asked in the prior times. So when we discuss the questions in a particular format we are revising the content and at the same time we are also understanding how to represent our answers to get the maximum marks in our examination so in university examination it is not just about the content it is not just about how much you know but what matters the most is how you are going to represent your answers how you represent your answers will yield you the most effective marks you might represent the same way as other students are representing which will put you in that same category how you excel from others is the way you represent your answers how you make your answer sheet look really beautiful make it easily understandable make it uh, you know uh, make catch the examiner's attention because the examiner has to go through numerous answer sheets so examiner has to see your answer sheet quite differently from other students and that's when he's going to appreciate that yes you are different from the rest of the lot and that is when you're going to yield a lot of answers with high answer high marks and examination so before that uh, before we go any further in the session i would just like want all of you to subscribe to the channel and uh, you know to so that you get regular updates of what's happening on the channel and also to understand you know if you want to make a comment or if you want to leave a feedback uh, once you have subscribed it becomes much more easier we have sessions lined up further as well and uh, to get notification of all these sessions that are going to happen further it's better that you subscribe to the channel and if you like my session do like and share as well so with this uh, let's let us understand what is the schedule for LRR in uh, third prof so basically in third prof we have ENT ophthal we have got PSM and uh, FMT so we are going to have uh, we are going to start the session with uh, you know with uh, with me today at uh, with ENT and then we have 26th we have got Dr. Ruchi Rai ma'am she is going to take up your ophthalmology and then we are going to have your Neha Taneja ma'am on 27 doing your PSM and then we are going to have Akhilesh sir taking your FMT on 31st and the rest of the schedule goes on from 28th of October until 13th of November. Uh, I mean sorry 16th of November where you're going to have coverage of all the second third and fourth prof for examinations that are going to happen. So with this let us begin our session and let us do the um, you know uh, uh, long essays that we have. So look at the question given to you here and the question says define otosclerosis what are its types what are the clinical features and management. I'll just give you a minute to think how you're going to represent your answers. Yes so just take a minute to think. Yes, so now that uh, there was a little bit of discontinuity, now let us uh, understand uh, 
you know what are how are we going to represent our answer for this particular question which is saying define otosclerosis what are its types clinical features and management and as you see each part has got an answer uh, has a marking given to it so for answering the types you get one mark for writing the clinical features you have two marks for the uh, for the definition you have one mark and for the management you have four marks so basically you are supposed to answer this question in subheadings and i will tell you how to answer this question and put your yourself apart from the rest so let's see what is the definition of otosclerosis so i'm sure all of you know what is otosclerosis we all know it is a condition where there is excessive deposition of bone around the food plate of stapes this is how we would normally define it as so here when we are trying trying to define otosclerosis we need to be even more specific to get the best answers so how do we define otosclerosis otosclerosis is first of all a disease of the otic capsule so if you see here you have to mention the first point because this is going to fetch you one mark how are we going to define it we are going to define it by saying where is the disease happening or what is the disease related to or which part of the labyrinth is this related to, related to so we're going to write that it is a disease of the bony labyrinth and here it is a disease that is related to the otic capsule here what is happening in otosclerosis by definition we are going to tell that it is a condition where the normally dense endochondral bone is replaced with what kind of bone it is replaced with spongy cancellous bone which is of greater thickness vascularity and cellularity so now you are defining actually the focus you are not saying there is excessive bone deposition that excessive bone deposition every xyz person is going to write and they are going to fetch half a mark for this one mark but if you are going to write there is replacement of endochondral bone with what with what type of bone you are telling that it is being replaced with a cancellous bone this cancellous bone is not that of a normal bone this has got a higher thickness this has got increased vascularity and this has got increased cellularity so you are defining this in terms of pathological definition you are defining it in terms of anatomical definition and also physiological definition so when you do this and give a definition in a more precise term you get definitely more ans more marks to your question so basically this is how you need to write your definition this is a condition where you see that that is a disease affecting the bony capsule and a bony labyrinth or the otic capsule where we have got replacement of the bone so this will definitely give you one mark in your exam then we'll go to the second part of the question the second part of the question was for two marks which says what are the two types of otosclerosis so we know there are two types one is called as the stepedial type and the second one is called as the cochlear type of otosclerosis right so what is stepedial type of otosclerosis stepedial Medial type of otosclerosis is a most common type of condition where we see that the disease is affecting the oval window. Cochlear type of otosclerosis is a condition where the, we see the disease is affecting your round window. And histological otosclerosis is, is detected post-mortem that is just detected after they review certain temporal bones for other conditions and doing while doing the post-mortem they have identified otosclerosis that is called as histological otosclerosis so these are the three definitions of how you're going to write the types of otosclerosis but is this enough for your exams is the question so what we are going to represent now is going to be a diagrammatic representation of course you're going to write all the three definitions you're going to write stepedial you're going to write cochlear you're going to write histological but now you try and draw a diagram for all the three that's when you're going to definitely get more marks so draw this as your tympanic membrane draw this as your middle ear this is your malleus this is your incus and this is your stapes going and sitting on the oval window right and here you have got the round window now if i do a diagram where i show there is excessive bony deposition happening around the food plate of the stapes this is going to be my stepedial type then we are going to have a second type where we are going to have excessive bone deposition across the round window this is going to be my cochlear type so now the examiner knows that you know the different types for sure and the examiner also knows about the types you are representing in the diagram so that he will be able to give you this complete two marks in your exams. So you have written clearly a definition, you have made a diagram, it's catching the attention of the examiner, he knows you know the content very well, you get your two marks right here and you go to the next part of the question. So what is the next part of the question? What are the clinical features of auto 
autosclerosis. So if we see the clinical features of autosclerosis, we already know all these features. We know there is going to be a hearing loss, the person has to raise the voice, there can be vertigo, there can be soft monotonous speech and this is the sign which we call it as the short sign. This is how every other normal person would represent or if we don't plan it prior to hand, we are going to represent our answers in this way. But what is more smarter way of representing your answers to get more marks in your exam? If I were in your position, how would I do it? Probably I would divide the clinical features into two subheadings and make a tabular format like this. I would write symptoms and then I would write the signs. Now, I would further discriminate these two into stepedial and cochlear. So, I would write this into stepedial type of otosclerosis and cochlear type of otosclerosis. So, what are the symptoms in stepedial type and what are the symptoms in cochlear type? So, if I take stepedial type of otosclerosis, what would be the type of hearing loss? So, I want all of you to think and try to in answer in the comment section, what is the phenomenon that we see in otosclerosis? Because uh, I see most of you are silent. So, give me the answer in the chat box. There is a phenomenon what we see in otosclerosis where the patient hears better in noisy environment as compared to silent environment. So, meanwhile, I write the answer for the stepedial and cochlear type. I want all of you to write the answer for this phenomenon in the chat box. Okay, so in stepedial type, we are going to have a gradually progressive conductive hearing loss. That's the first symptom. Other than that, do they have any other symptom? Other than that, they do not have any major symptom. They have to increase their voice. They have got a soft monotonous speech. So, these will be my symptoms for a patient with stepedial type of otosclerosis. For cochlear type of otosclerosis, what will be the symptom? Here they can have sensory neural hearing loss. So, please mark it in your answers very clearly so that the examiner knows conductive in stepedial type, sensory neural in cochlear type. And then we are going to also write other than sensory neural hearing loss, what are the other symptoms? Here we can have tinnitus and we can also have vertigo. So, this is how the examiner will know that for sure you know what are the symptoms in the stepedial type, you know what are the symptoms in the cochlear type, you know the difference in the symptoms where you get conductive hearing loss, where you get sensory neural hearing loss and you have clearly represented it in a tabular format. Now, along with this draw write this in a different color in your exam where you write paraacusis vilsi. Very good uh, Sidhu, Mukul, Tarun. Uh, absolutely right. This phenomenon is called as paraacusis vilsi. So, what is paraacusis vilsi? The patient hears better in noisy environment as compared to silent environment. This phenomenon is called as paraacusis vilsi. So, now you can understand if you write it in tabular format, yes, it's a good thing to do in a tabular format. I agree that it's a nice thing to do. I mean, if you just write bullet points, it's a good thing to do. But instead of that, if you make a flow chart like this, it will tell the examiner very clearly that you know what are the symptoms of a patient, you have clearly differentiated stepedial and cochlear, you have shown conductive and sensory neural and you are also writing a very important phenomenon paraacusis vilsi. So, this will give insight to the examiner and you get your marks for sure. <coughs> now, what are the signs we see in otosclerosis? So, when it comes to signs, the first sign that we are going to write is going to be tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane will be normal. But you see that through the tympanic membrane, there is a flamingo pink appearance. That flamingo pink appearance that you see of the promontory seen through the intact tympanic membrane, we call that sign as the Schwartz sign. So, you are going to mention this sign. This sign is called as short sign. Now, we are going to mention signs only in the stepedial type because cochlear type does not have any specific signs that we see on the external uh, ear or the tympanic membrane. So, we are going to mention the tympanic membrane is normal and you see flamingo pink appearance of the promontory seen through the tympanic membrane and this sign is called as short sign. So, this way if you write your clinical features expressing your signs, expressing your important wordings, you have shown conductive sense neural paraacusis will say short sign tympanic membrane is normal it is restricting having restricted mobility this will yield you your two marks in the examination so this is how you got to go ahead with it 
we are also going to discuss on the tuning fork test because that is very important when it comes to the examination part of a patient because the patient has come to you only with hearing loss. A otosclerotic patient will tell you that I have hearing loss. So they have come to you with hearing loss only. So what should you do in tuning fork test? You should mention about the Rinne's, about the Weber's, about the absolute bone conduction test and Jelly's test. Now since stepedial type happens to be the most common one, you are going to write about Rinne's for stepedial type of otosclerotic sclerosis only. So in stepedial type of otosclerosis, you will see that Rinne's test is negative for 256 and 512 hertz initially. But when the stapes becomes completely fixed, when you see there is a complete stapes fixation, what will you see? Rinne is negative even for 1024 hertz tuning folks. So this is what you are going to write initially negative for 512 and 256. But when the stapes is fixed, it is negative at 1024 hertz as well. Now Weber's test will show lateralization towards the diseased side, towards the side where there is conductive hearing loss, you are going to see the Weber getting lateralized towards the diseased side. Absolute bone conduction will be the same as examiner because it is a conductive hearing loss. In sensory neural hearing loss, it is going to go to the opposite side. And Jelly's test is positive if this tapis foot plate is fixed. So Jelly's test positive will tell you the fixation of foot plate of tapis. So I hope this clears your tuning fork test. Now, what are the investigations? So, the last part of the question was management where we were going to discuss about investigation and about the treatment. So, when we are going to discuss about the invest management, we start with investigations first. So, what are the investigations that we are going to do for patients with otosclerosis? First and foremost, we are going to do an audiometry. So, when we do an audiometry, what are you going to see? You have to draw a graph. Now, this is something you should learn to draw. In a patient with otosclerosis, what type of graph do you see? There is a specific uh, notch. Can anybody tell me what is that notch seen in audiometry? What uh, There is a dip at a particular frequency and there is a name given to it. So please tell me in the chat box what is the dip, at what frequency do you see the dip and what is the name of that notch. So we are going to draw a left ear graph because I am using, okay let me take a right ear graph, let me make the color red. Okay, so we are going to represent air conduction and bone conduction. So, 0 is a symbol for air conduction. This is definitely going to be abnormal. So, AC is abnormal. Very good, Asif. And what about BC? BC is represented by lesser than symbol. So, at 2000 hertz, you see a dip in the BC curve. So, this is 0, this is 20, 30, so on. So, at 2000 hertz, you see a dip in the BC curve. What is this notch called as? This notch is called as Karhart's notch. And Karhart's notch is specific for what condition? It is specific for otosclerosis. Correct? Very good, Mukul. Very good, Shreyas, Asif, Siddhu, Urvashi. Very good. So, Karhart's notch is a dip seen in which curve? In the bone conduction curve. Essentially, is normal. But you see a dip at 2000 hertz. AC is definitely affected or abnormal. So this kind of a audiometric graph is going to tell you that this is a patient who is having otosclerosis. So TK pure tone audiometry, you understood what to write, what to you know, what to mention that you have understood. Now let us see what will you see on tympanometry. Can anybody tell me on tympanometry what would happen to um, you know the uh, the tympanometric curve? and what is the name that we see is it a a s a d b or c and what would happen to stepedial reflex so can you please tell me in the chat box what is it yes so if you see tympanometry typically there are different graphs that we see which is called as a a s a d b or c so what type of graph do we get here in tympanometry we get a small graph where the peak is at zero and this type of a graph which is small we call it as an a s type of graph Yes, so I am waiting for your answers to understand what would happen to stepedial reflex. Yes. I am waiting for your answers guys, come on. What do you think would happen to the stepedial reflex? See, because the stapes is fixed, what would happen to the stepedial tendon? The stepedial tendon would probably con would not be able to contract because the stapes has already gotten fixed and it is not mobile. So, there is absent stepedial reflex. 
Yes, very good Asif. Siddhu, B type of a graph, you get it whenever you got fluid or effusion in the middle ear. So, here you don't get a B type of a graph, here you get an AS type of a graph and stepedial reflex is absent. So, very importantly, when you are mentioning the investigation, please mention in pure tone audiometry the name Karhat's notch. Please mention tympanometry showing to you an AS type of a graph. Stepedial reflex is absent. Okay, so these are the things that you're going to mention. Now, what about speech audiometry? What will happen to the speech audiometry? Is speech uh, understanding going to be affected? No, it's not getting affected. So, speech audiometry is normal unless there is an involvement of cochlea, which could happen in cochlear otosclerosis. So, speech audiometry is essentially normal. Now, is there any role of HRCT temporal bone? I want answers from all of you. Should we get a HRCT done for patients with otosclerosis? Sclerosis. Essentially, there is no role of HRCT in patients with otosclerosis. The role of HRCT temporal bone in patients with otosclerosis is when they have got a cochlear type of otosclerosis. So, when they have a cochlear type of otosclerosis and you do a HRCT, you see a sign. What is that sign called as? The sign is called as double ring sign. So, if you see this double ring sign, that is suggestive to you of which type of otosclerosis that is telling to you about cochlear type of otosclerosis. So, now the examiner knows you not just know the audiometry findings, not just the tympanometry, not just, not just the stepedial reflex. You are also trying to check if there is a cochlear type of otosclerosis and you are doing a HRCT. Now, how do you establish a definitive diagnosis? Which investigation will tell you for for sure there is otosclerosis or not. So, what is that investigation that is going to tell you definitely there is otosclerosis or not? So, the definitive diagnosis for a patient with otosclerosis is established only on opening the middle ear and checking the ossicular mobility. So, definitive diagnosis is established only in surgery. So, in surgery, I will move the malleus and I will see if it is mobile, then I know that uh, I mean malleus is not the ossicle that has got fixed. I will touch the incus and see if it is mobile or not. And when I touch the stapes, if it is not mobile, that's when I get the confirmation that it is otosclerosis. So, definitive diagnosis is only during surgery or intraoperative. So, when you do an intraoperative mobilization of stapes, it will tell you the diagnosis. So, try to mobilize the stapes and what will happen? It will be fixed. So, now you know how to represent a long essay, you know how to identify the diagnosis, you have understood the test, you know how to represent the answer and you know what type of graph you should do for these patients, right? So, I hope everybody got the answers for the investigation part. Now, the question is about the treatment. The last part of the question had 4 marks. If you had seen the management of patients with otosclerosis. So, investigation ke liye there was 2 marks. Just may you are going to mention all this. Pure tone audiometry, tympanometry, speech audiometry, HRCT and about definitive diagnosis. That would fetch you 2 marks and then treatment would fetch you 2 marks. So, what is the definitive treatment of patients with otosclerosis? So, for patients with otosclerosis, the treatment is going to be either medical or either surgical or either hearing aid. There are three definitive forms of treatment. So, what are the three forms of treatment? The first one is medical treatment. The second one is surgical treatment. The third one is going to be hearing aid. So, in medical treatment, what will we give? So, in medical treatment, sodium fluoride is the drug of choice. So, sodium fluoride, what is the mechanism of action? Also, you can write it only inhibits the activity of the focus. So, it inhibits the further progression of the disease. But does it reverse back the disease? No, it does not reverse back the disease. So, it inhibits only the further progression. So, you can give it for patients who are having cochlear otosclerosis to arrest the disease further. And what is the dosage? 50 mg twice daily for 1 year to 2 years is what you are going to give and that is going to be your 
treatment for medical therapy. What is surgical therapy? There are two surgeries, stepidectomy and stepidotomy. Now you can choose to write the answer like this in word format where you write stepidectomy where the entire stepi suprastructure is removed and replaced with a piston that is called as stepidectomy with placement of processes or you can also write stepidotomy in the same line format. But if you really want to get more marks, what you should do is probably draw a diagrammatic representation. So how will you draw stepidectomy and stepidotomy? Let us see. So if you take this as malleus and this as incus and this as your put plate of the stapes resting on the oval window. So, if you remove the entire stapi supra structure and now from the anchor, from the incus to the foot plate of the stapes, you have put a piston. This surgery will be your stapidectomy with placement of prosthesis. So, now if you draw this diagram, examiner knows that you know what is happening in stepidectomy. You have shown the malleus, you have shown the incus, you have shown the stapes foot plate and now you are showing how the stapes foot plate is connected to the incus via the piston. This is how you would probably represent your answer for a stepidectomy. Now, if you wanted to show the same for a stepidotomy, what you would do? You would probably draw this as your malleus, this as your incus and this as your foot plate of the stapes. And now you are going to probably make a hole here and now anchor your piston from the incus to the hole that you have created. So you can show the hole in a different color so that the examiner knows it. So you can show that there is a hole in made in the foot plate of stapes. Right. So now the examiner clearly knows you know what is stepidectomy, you know what is stepidotomy, you are giving diagrammatic representations. If you want, you can write a full uh, lines for it and that will help you get your two marks you, because this was having your two marks. Management had investigation and treatment. So investigations to be finished and treatment ke liye you have drawn two diagrams, you have written medical management, you have written surgical management and of course not to miss the hearing aid. So those who are denying surgery or do not want surgery or those who want uh, you know who are unfit for surgery those are the patients who would preferably benefit with hearing aid so this is how you would write the management of patients with otosclerosis so if you revisit back we started with uh, what is the definition where i told you very clearly you have to write anatomical pathological and the physiological definition what is happening in otosclerosis then i told you about the types of otosclerosis stepedial cochlear and histological then I told you about what are the symptoms and signs. I told you specifically classify the symptoms for stepedial and cochlear and for the signs I told you what is what sign and then I told you to understand about what are the management where you were discussing about investigation and about the treatment. So in investigation part we discussed about pure tone audiometry, impedance audiometry, speech audiometry and about uh, the specific test that we do for otosclerosis which is cochlear type and of course we also discussed about uh, how to definitely diagnose it and the treatment part is medical surgical and hearing aid so i think this is uh, clear for all of you regarding otosclerosis chalo so with this that we have finished otosclerosis let's go to the second question of long essay which is going to be your menias disease so Describe Meniere's disease in the following headings. They have asked you etiology, they have asked you clinical features, they have asked you investigations, they have asked you treatment. So I want all of you to just think for a moment, how would you represent your answers? For all of you, I, there is a question right now. Can you tell me what is the triad of Meniere's disease? So in this triad, what are the three things you are going to see? I am waiting for your answers. Tell me what is the triad of Meniere's disease.
Yes, so I see Asif, conductive hearing loss is not a part of the triad. Very good, Tarun. Very good, Shreyas. Asif, nystagmus is a is a, a sign that we see in meniers, but it is not a part of the triad. So, first of all, jaise hi you hear the word meniers disease, what should flash into your head? VST. What does V stand for? V stands for vertigo. S stands for sensory neural hearing loss and T stands for tinnitus. So, this triad of vertigo, sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus is what we see in meniers disease. So, first of all, this shortcut should be given in the exam what is meniers. Because if you remember a little bit about it, you will be able to solve it further. So, VST will remember in meniers. If VST will remember, then the rest will be able to remember a little bit. So, the question is asking you etiology for one mark, clinical features for two marks investigations for three marks and four marks is for treatment so if you look at seventh mark is only for the management part okay yes so we will start with etiology clinical features investigations and treatment for patients with menias disease Chalo. So basically, what is happening in patients with Meniere's disease? In patients with Meniere's disease, there is increased endolymph production and decreased reabsorption. So if I were you and if I had to represent my answer in a better way, I would probably draw the structure of the cochlea and I would mention the three compartments, scala vestibuli, scala media, and scala tympani. So, now tell me what is which part of the inner ear is the uh, menias disease affecting? Is it affecting the cochlea having the scala vestibuli or the scala media or the scala tympani? Where is the disease? Yes. Uh, Khadija Naz, you are going to have session for pharmacology coming. In the starting part of the, of the session, I have given you the timetable. So, there is mention of all the schedule. You have second, third and fourth prof ka at the moment plan. You will have the first prof coming later. But right now, we have the sessions lined up of second prof, third prof and fourth prof. We are starting with the third prof subjects and then uske baad hoga fourth prof and last mein hoga second prof ka subjects. But sare hi subjects ke honge, theek hai? Yes, very good Shreyas and Tarun, this is affecting the scala media of the cochlea. So, in the scala media, we have got stria vascularis. So, here in stria vascularis, what is happening? There is increased endolymph production and there is decreased reabsorption. So, there is increased production and there is decreased reabsorption. So, what I would do? I would write endolymph and I would write increased production decreased reabsorption and what is happening because of that there is endolymphatic hypertension and because of the endolymphatic hypertension the patient is having this disease which we call it as Meniere's disease. Right? So, I hope everybody got it. If you had to define, how would you define? You would probably write it as uh, stria vascularis is getting affected where there is increased endolymph production, there is decreased reabsorption and there is endolymphatic hypertension and this is responsible for causing Meniere's disease. So, if you represent this way in your exam, the examiner knows ki ye bache ko pata hai ki kaha pe ho hai disease, kya ho hai. Then he would probably not even check your answer further, just give you marks. Okay, but anyways, how do we write it further? Now, what is the etiology or causes? The answer given to this, the marks given to this question is going to be one mark. So, here what we see is there is vasomotor disturbance. Why is there a vasomotor disturbance? Because of spasm of the internal auditory artery causing decreased circulation or blood flow to the inner ear. Allergy is the second cause, sodium and water retention, hypothyroidism, excessive intake of caffeine and tea and autoimmune causes and viral etiology, these have been associated with Meniere's disease. So, why is there increased production and decreased resorption? Secondly, to sodium and water retention, caffeine intake, allergy, autoimmune diseases, viral causes, vasomotor disturbances, these are all the causes responsible for causing Meniere's disease. 
Okay, so this would definitely fetch you your one mark. Now let's go to the clinical features of patients with Meniere's disease. So we know the triad is VST, vertigo, sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus. So we are going to elaborate the same. So we are going to elaborate vertigo, we are going to elaborate the sensory neural hearing loss, we are going to elaborate the tinnitus. So how are we going to elaborate each one of this? Now how is the vertigo? Is it uh, you know uh, a sudden in onset or it is gradual in onset? How is the onset? It is sudden in onset please remember for meniere's the disease the vertigo lasts for few minutes to few hours this wording you have to know so the vertigo lasts for few minutes to few hours and it is associated with nausea vomiting uh, abdominal cramping and vagal symptoms so here this is very important that it is associated with nausea vomiting cold sweats diarrhea and very very importantly you should mention vagal symptoms in your answers so, ye ho gaya first part of vertigo. Now, how is the hearing loss? Is hearing loss constantly present or is it a fluctuating type of hearing loss? Only during the attack, jab ho raha increased pressure in the inner ear fluids, the patient will have hearing loss. So, it is not a constant hearing loss. It is typically a fluctuating type of sensory neural hearing loss. So, it is not constantly present. It is a fluctuating type of sensory neural hearing loss. Now, here they have got a phenomenon where they have intolerance to loud sound. Can anybody tell me in the chat box what is that phenomenon called as when a patient hears the sound and gets vertigo usko ek phenomenon kehte hai usko likhna padega yaha pe so can you tell me what is that phenomenon called as meanwhile i'll keep discussing what is the type of hearing loss so here we get fluctuating type of sensory neural hearing loss and here they have got a phenomenon where there is distortion of sound which we call it as dipla acusis now Typically in almost all the ENT conditions, we see that the high frequencies are affected first in the disease. So we see high frequency hearing loss like 5000 hertz, 6000 hertz, 8000 hertz, 10,000 hertz. So the higher frequencies get affected. Meniere's is the only condition where we see that there is a low frequency affected. So lower frequencies are affected in Meniere's disease. So this point likna zaruri hai. Fluctuating type, dipla acusis and low frequency sensory neural type of hearing loss. Very good. So Siddhu, Asif, Shreyas, absolutely right. That phenomenon is called as Tulio's phenomenon. So what is Tulio's phenomenon? On exposure to sound, the patient experiences vertigo that phenomenon is called as Tulio's phenomenon. So on exposure to sound, a patient experiences vertigo. So they have intolerance to loud sound. That phenomenon is called as Tulio's phenomenon. So you're going to describe vertigo. You're going to describe hearing loss. It's not constantly present. It's fluctuating type not high frequency low frequencies affected they have distortion of sound which we call it as diplacusis or double hearing this is typically present during the episode of vertigo and disappears after the vertigo has resolved now the third triad symptom is tinnitus so how is the tinnitus the tinnitus is that of a roaring type of tinnitus so you can see here there is a roaring or a hissing type of tinnitus so clinical features ho gaya symptoms to why vst ko aapne elaborate kiya v s and t so once you have elaborated that then you have to go to the signs what are the signs we see in a patient with meniere's disease of course the external ear middle ear is normal so external canal will be normal tympanic membrane will be normal and uh, there will be nothing that is visible on the outside so ear examination will essentially be normal but you will see nystagmus which is called as to and fro movement of the eyeball now what happens in nystagmus it is seen only during the attack matlab jab meniere's ka attack hua hai vertigo hai tabhi patient will have this nystagmus the direction of nystagmus is something that the examiner is looking for you from your exam answer sheet so the direction of nystagmus is directed towards the deceased ear or the affected ear so you will see that there is a horizontal rotatory nystagmus with a slow component or fa and a fast component the fast component of the nystagmus is towards the deceased ear 
So if the patient has got nystagmus towards the right side, the fast component of nystagmus is towards the right side. It means that the right ear is having Meniere's disease. So fast component will tell you what is the direction of nystagmus and it is towards the deceased ear. Okay, so nystagmus ka ho gaya, abhi next is how when a patient comes to you, you will do tuning fork test. Tuning fork test will suggest to you sensory neural hearing loss. So sensory neural hearing loss mein kya ho ga? Rene will be positive. Weber will be towards the deceased side or towards the opposite side. Weber will be towards the opposite side. Absolute bone conduction will not be the same, will be reduced as compared to that of the examiner. So, these are the signs that you are going to elicit whenever a patient with Meniere's disease will come to you. Theke? Now comes the investigations, just ke liye 3 marks were allotted in your question paper. They had asked you, what are the investigations do you do for a patient with Meniere's disease? So, 3 marks was for in investigations and 4 marks were given for your treatment. So, uske hisab se we have to frame our answer. So, if they ask you for investigations 3 marks, how will you investigate? So, first and foremost, pure tone audiometry. What will pure tone audiometry show you? Pure tone audiometry will show you a sensory neural type of hearing loss. Because of course, this is a disease affecting your um, inner ear. So, you are going to have the cochlea involved. So, a sensory neural type of hearing loss. But examiner ko isse usko pata chalega ki shayad tumne ratke kiya hoga. Ye SNHL hai pata hoga. But if you draw a graph something like this where you are showing air conduction with zero and bone conduction with lesser than symbol and you are showing an upsloping type of a graph. So, you will write zero as AC lesser than as BC and now you are showing AC and BC are affected with AC being affected more at lower frequency. So, you see that the hearing loss is more at lower frequencies. So, this type where you get low frequencies affected and you get an upsloping type of a graph, this is highly suggestive of Meniere's disease. Okay, so if you do this and if you mark this in your examination and show this to the examiner, Kina, I know the graph of Meniere's, I know it is a sensory neural type, AC and BC both are affected, there is low frequencies affected and you will see an upsloping type of a graph that is suggestive to you of Meniere's disease. Now, what about speech audiometry? Now, speech audiometry is affected whenever there is a retrocochlear pathology. Because this is a cochlear pathology, you will see that the speech audiometry is essentially normal. So, speech audiometry scores are essentially normal. Then, uh, what about, uh, you know, how do we understand is this a cochlear pathology or a retrocochlear pathology? One test that is done specifically to identify cochlear pathology is called as recruitment. So, you have to write about the special test which is called as recruitment. Recruitment is positive whenever there is a cochlear pathology and this test for recruitment is CC. What is CC? Short increment sensitivity index. So, if the scores are uh, you know more than 70 percent it tells you that the patient is having a cochlear pathology and it is suggestive of Meniere's disease. Now tone decay test, tone decay is a test done for your retrocochlear pathology. So when there is no tone decay it says that there is no retrocochlear pathology. So special tests like recruitment, CC and tone decay are done to differentiate cochlear from retrocochlear pathology. Then what is the investigation of choice? This is what the examiner is looking for. He is trying to ask you what is the investigation of choice just say pata chale ki ye meniers hai ya nahi hai. So, for this you are going to write electrocochleography. So, electrocochleography measures the cochlear potentials. When you give a sound wave, we keep a probe on the promontory and measure the electrical activity happening in the cochlea. So, here SP by AP ratio loge, if the SP by AP ratio is more than 30% or 0.3, it is suggestive to you of Meniere's disease. So, quickly, what is the investigation of choice? It is electrocochleography. Do you think it nai kafi hai exam me 3 marks ke liye to write investigations? No, you have written audiometry, you have written speech audiometry, you have written special tests, you have written electrocochleography. But do we have to do other tests? Yes, we have to do caloric tests, we have to do electronystagmography, we have to do BERA and we have to do MRI. Ye sare tests, sare bache bhool jayenge, pehle wale char sab ko yaad rahega, ye wale char sab bhool jayenge. This is what will yield you that extra marks in your examination. So, if you see caloric test, caloric test, har 
पेशेंट जिसको वर्टाइगो होता है उसको कैलरिक टेस्ट करते हैं कैलरिक टेस्ट विल शो यू कैनाल पैरासिस मीनिंग रेड्यूस्ड रेस्पॉन्स ऑन द डिसीज साइड सो कैलोरिक रेस्पॉन्स इज रेड्यूस्ड ग्लिसरॉल टेस्ट इज पॉजिटिव वॉट इज ग्लिसरॉल टेस्ट इन ग्लिसरॉल टेस्ट यू आर गोइंग टू डू अ प्योर टोन ऑडियोमेट्री विच इज योर बेस लाइन and then you are going to measure the pure tone average okay kitna hai hearing then you will give glycerol after giving glycerol 30 to 45 minutes later you will see that you do a repeat pure tone audiometry on repeat pure tone audiometry what will you see there will be improvement in your audiological scores so when there is improvement in your audiological scores that will tell you that this is definitely a patient who has a probability of menias so very importantly glycerol test ke bare mein likhna hai and then you are going to talk about other tests like e ENG, Bera and MRI. Basically, ENG is done to rule out if there is any other vestibular pathology. Bera is done to differentiate if there is a retrocochlear pathology, and MRI is done to identify if there is any other cerebellopontine angle pathology. So these are the tests that you should mention, and the purpose is also to be mentioned. Okay? ठीक है. So everyone is clear regarding the investigations. तो अभी तीन marks का था investigation. उसके लिए हमने काफी सारा लिख लिया. We have written about the uh, written about audiometry, speech audiometry, about electrocochleography. We have written about caloric test, ENG, Bera and MRI. And I think with this three marks तो आपके pocket में आना ही चाहिए. Okay, so treatment part me you can write so much about treatment, but here I will just mention you because four marks is given for treatment part. चार मार्क्स एक्सपेक्टेड है फ्रॉम द ट्रीटमेंट पार्ट सो आई विल टेल यू टू डिवाइड द ट्रीटमेंट इनटू जनरल मेजर्स एज योर फर्स्ट सब हेडिंग सेकेंड हेडिंग वुड बी टू मैनेज एन अक्यूट अटैक मीनिंग अ पेशेंट कमिंग टू यू विथ एन अक्यूट डिसीज हाउ यू आर गोइंग टू टू मैनेज सो जनरल मेजर स्टॉप अवॉइड यू नो अवॉइड कॉफी इनटेक टी इनटेक अवॉइड स्मोकिंग कंज्यूम अ लो सॉल्ट डाइट एंड लाइफ स्टाइल मॉडिफिकेशन ऑल ऑफ दिस विल बी अ पार्ट ऑफ योर जनरल मेजर्स देन यू आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट अक्यूट अटैक so when a patient with acute menias comes to you what will you do you will give first and foremost very importantly is your vestibular sedatives diphenhydramine dimethyldenate promethazine fluoroclorpirazine will be the drugs if necessary rarely do you have to give iv diazepam and vasodilators to increase the blood supply to the inner ear like carbogen or inhalation uh, carbogen inhalation for improving the blood circulation to the inner ear so this is how you would basically write so ye do हेडिंग से तो आपको एक मार्क लाइक से हाफ हाफ मार्क फॉर ईच हेडिंग और इवन इफ यू टेक वन वन मार्क सो यू इधर गेट वन टू टू मार्क्स इन दिस सब हेडिंग्स नाउ दिस इज समथिंग दैट इज इंपॉर्टेंट नाउ हाउ डू यू मैनेज अ क्रॉनिक डिसीज दिस विल बी योर थर्ड सब हेडिंग ऑफ मैनेजिंग अ पेशेंट विद क्रॉनिक डिसीज Yes, Tarun Singh, you are going to get the PDF uh, after the session. We will upload the PDF, and you can get the PDF. Okay, we will mention it in the comment section uh, of the video. Where, uh, whether you in the YouTube, where the video is going to be in the same comment section, you are going to have the PDF. You can get it from there. Any other questions? Please do ask me in the chat box. I am here to help you because this is more a theoretical session. I am not asking you for lot of questions. This is not MCQ based or uh, this is not something for your uh, you know for your NEET or FMG or for your competitive exams. We are discussing more on theoretical lines and how to present our answers in the exam. So, if any doubt is and if you really want me to answer some specific part of a question which is not even mentioned in this topic, you can feel free to ask me for that. Right. So, how do we manage in chronic diseases? Prochlorperazine, beta histine, furosemide, and hydrochlorothiazide are the drugs of choice, and you will give this. You can uh, eliminate the allergens. Hormonal balance has to be corrected. Now, what is most important is chemical labyrinthectomy. The examiner is looking for this word, which is chemical labyrinthectomy. If you have mentioned this or not. okay so here we are going to do a injection of what intratympanic gentamicin g is for gentamicin so what is intratympanic gentamicin you can represent this with a diagram so that your examiner knows your answer that you are answering uh, with a knowledge of it so this is your malleus this is your incus and this is your stapes this is your round window so you take a syringe with a needle and you inject gentamicin into the middle ear 
so when you inject gentamicin into the middle ear the drug, drug gets absorbed via your round window into the scala vestibuli of the cochlea and from the scala vestibuli it will go to the scala media as well so this is how the gentamicin is going to destroy the labyrinth so when gentamicin will destroy the labyrinth will the labyrinth be functional anymore to cause vertigo yes there will be no vertigo but will there be hearing now there will be a permanent snhl so there will be a permanent snhl okay so if you want to write about intratympanic gentamicin do mention about intra uh, how to give the drug you take a syringe and a needle and inject gentamicin injection into the middle ear it gets absorbed from the round window into the scala vestibuli from there it goes to the scala media and this is an ototoxic drug so it will destroy the labyrinth once it destroys the labyrinth there will be no vertigo but this would also result in permanent snhl so this is what you are going to write in terms of chemical labyrinthectomy that the exam is looking for but also remember there is another drug that we are giving in if the patient want to have a hearing to be preserved so instead of intratympanic gentamicin we can give intratympanic steroids so intratympanic steroids or intratympanic gentamicin are given for patients with menier's disease so acute we told about basically in the treatment part we discussed three headings the first one is modification of lifestyle the second one is acute attack the third one was about chronic disease then we have to talk about surgical because this was a four mark question to humko detail mein likhna padega tabhi char marks aayenge exam mein hamare paas so how we how are we going to treat this surgically surgically we can do conservative procedures and destructive procedures conservative procedures and destructive procedures का डिफरेंस क्या है कंजर्वेटिव प्रोसीजर हियर आर हियरिंग इज प्रिजर्व राइट सो हियर द हियरिंग इज प्रिजर्व इन डिस्ट्रक्टिव प्रोसीजर देर इज नो हियरिंग प्रिजर्वेशन सो हियर देर इज गोइंग टू बी नो हियरिंग प्रिजर्वेशन एट ऑल सो कंजर्वेटिव देर इज हियरिंग प्रिजर्वेशन इन डिस्ट्रक्टिव देर इज नो हियरिंग no hearing improvement that can be expected so here in conservative procedure endolymphatic sac decompression endolymphatic shunt operation you can do a sacculotomy you can do a cochleosacculotomy you can do a vex say vestibular nerve sectioning and you can do destruction of the labyrinth and if there is a destructive procedure that is nothing but your total labyrinthectomy so we knew that the treatment part has got four marks so we have divided it into four subheadings management of general conditions number 2 we talked about acute attack chronic disease and surgical therapy so if you write all these you get sure shot your four marks in your examination so i'm sure that uh, all of you understood this yes treyas moge intra uh, you know my, micro wick and micro catheters are drug delivery systems that we use across the round window so here our aim is to deliver the drug across the round window so i can give injection if i don't want to give injection i can put a wick a wick is something like your dia that has a wick inside right so we put a absorbent material and place it over the round window and on the outside we will put the drop the wick will absorb the drop and slowly uh, transmit or transfer the drops from the middle ear to the inner ear so it's a one time procedure where you go surgically and put a wick across the round window and keep the other end of the wick in the canal you keep on administering the drugs over 3 4 5 weeks and then once the patient has had relief of symptoms you are going to take the wick off so micro wick and micro catheter are drug delivery devices that we have across the round window got it yes chalo let's go to the next question which is a clinical question asked to you an adolescent male 16 years of age presents with recurrent epistaxis on examination there's a purple colored mass in the nasopharynx can you tell what is the diagnosis denumerate the etiology summarize the clinical features and write the correct management so i'm waiting from all of you to understand what is the diagnosis in this case what do you think is the diagnosis of this patient so they have given you very specific parts they have given you male they have given you adolescent they have given you 16 years they have given to you with epistaxis they have given you purple colored mass in the nasopharynx can you all tell me what is the diagnosis here 
I'm waiting for you. See, this is all a competency based curriculum that you have today. And today we are going to get questions like this in your examination that's going to check your clinical competency to understand are you just puttifying or memorizing things or ratifying things rather than really getting to the uh, real depth of the concept. So they will give you this clinical questions and it is expected that you should know answers for this as well. Yes, I'm waiting for your answers. I'm waiting for your answers. What is the diagnosis? Of course, I'm going to describe the etiology. I'm just going to describe the clinical features and management. So one mark is for your diagnosis, two marks is for your etiology, three marks is for your clinical features and four marks is for your management. So we are going to discuss in detail here. Uh, Shreyas, it's not ecchymosis. See, basically when they are talking to you of a condition of a mass in the nasopharynx in a juvenile male, what do you think should be the diagnosis here? Very good, Siddhu. The diagnosis is going to be juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. So, the diagnosis here is juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. But if you just write this one line in your diagnosis, the examiner will give you half mark. He, he will not give you one complete mark. How do we get to that one complete mark? You will write JNA is the diagnosis in view of. What are the things that we know in view of adolescent age? Because we know JNA is a disease exclusively seen in adolescents. It is a disease exclusive to males, right? So, they have given you that question. It is a que condition that presents to you with massive epistaxis or bleeding from nose. This is your third clue. And the fourth clue is there is a reddish purple mass in the nasopharynx. So, with these clues, this is already there in your question paper. You don't have to memorize. You have seen these words in your question paper. So, exam mein question paper mein dikh hai. To usko dekh ke hi tumne bola hai. So, if you write JNA is the diagnosis in view of these pointers, these pointers which are given here. Now, you think examiner will give you half mark or will he give you one full mark? Yes, he will definitely give you your one few full marks. So, likhne ke time mein how you represent, kitna aapko samajhta hai is not what is important in your examination, especially university. How you make sure that you have represented your answer well, your examiner is happy and contented that you are giving what he wants. That is how you fetch your marks to the, uh, you know, to the highest marks and to get that gold medal in your exams, right? Very good, Siddhu. Uh, Mitali Asif, very good. This answer is JNA, very nice. So, what is the etiology of JNA? Basically, there is usually no cause. So, idiopathic, it can be due to activation of new to oncogen, it could be due to trauma, inflammation, infection, and allergy. So, these are all what are the triggers. So, basically, what is happening in juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma is there are some cell rests. These cell rests are when they are exposed to increased levels of testosterone and when do you see increased level of testosterone you see this increased level of testosterone during your adolescence what will happen when there is increased level of testosterone the cell rest the congenital cell rest or the nidus which we call it as the nidus responsible for outbreak or uh, you know proliferation of jna this nidus gets activated and when it gets activated these embryonic cell rest will proliferate and when they proliferate it is going to cause this juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma so this is how you are going to write your etiology so etiology ke liye ek diagnosis ke liye ek mark tha etiology ke liye do mark tha itna likhoge to kafi hoga mil jayega aapko apna marks now the next thing is about symptoms what are the symptoms now you can again write your symptoms like this where there is epistaxis there is nasal obstruction there is hearing loss there is a, a change in voice etc but if i were in your place how would i represent this to get maximum marks maybe i would have represented this in a in a blank sheet like this i would have written symptoms of jna and i would have divided this into three broad categories what would be my three broad categories my first broad category would be bleeding the second one would be obstruction and the third one would be cranial nerve palsies right so bleeding obstruction 
and cranial nerve palsy. So, how is the bleeding? The bleeding is recurrent. It is not single episode of bleeding. How is the bleeding? Is it simple bleeding, minor bleeding or profuse bleeding? So, it is recurrent, profuse bleeding. Is it provoked? Is there any, uh, you know, uh, provoking agent like the patient picked his nose, he coughed, he sneezed, anything a provoking agent? No. So, it is recurrent, unprovoked, profuse epistaxis. Okay, so bleeding is recurrent, unprovoked and profuse epistaxis. Sometimes there can also be anemia. So, this is what the examiner wants from you. So, recurrent, profuse, unprovoked epistaxis with anemia. Now, how is the obstruction? The obstruction can be divided into two further subparts, nasal obstruction and eustachian tubal obstruction. So, nasal obstruction, what type of a deformity, whether it is widening of the nasal bridge, swelling of the eye, swelling of the cheek, proptosis of the eyes, we call that deformity as frog face deformity. <clears throat> so, this is what is expected from you to write frog face deformity. Eustachian tubal obstruction, because the nasopharynx has got the opening of the eustachian tube, because of eustachian tubal obstruction, what could happen? There will be unilateral SOM. So, unilateral serous otitis media is what they are going to expect from you. Cranial nerve palsies. Now, if the lesion spread superiorly to the cavernous sinus through the sphenoid sinus, what are the cranial nerves that are going to be involved? It is going to be the second, third, fourth, fifth and the sixth cranial nerves. So, cranial nerve involvement will be second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth cranial nerve. So, this is what they are going to expect out of you in the examination when it comes to symptoms. If you write these three broad categories of bleeding, obstruction and cranial nerve palsies they know that you have known the symptoms you can also draw a diagrammatic representation of the symptoms for the examiner to understand uh, what you're talking better so if you had to draw a diagrammatic representation how would you do that i will show it to you so you would draw something like this you would show that the mass is originating from the spinopalatine foramen and going to the nasopharynx. So, if it goes anteriorly, what would happen? It would cause widening of nasal bridge. It would cause proptosis of the eye. And it would cause nasal obstruction what would you call this deformity as also sometimes swelling of the cheek so we would label this entire deformity as frog face deformity so you could draw it like this then we have got eustachian tubal obstruction so you will have the eustachian tube getting obstructed because there's a mass in the nasopharynx so eustachian tubal obstruction would result in what type it would result in unilateral som and then if it goes superiorly from the sphenoid sinus to the cavernous sinus, what would eventually it result in? Eventually it would result in cranial nerve palsies. So here you will write cranial nerve palsies because it is involving the sphenoid sinus and the cavernous sinus. So this is what you are going to write and diagrammatically represent. Of course bleeding if you want to show, you can show a few drops of blood coming from the nose and that you can represent in the form of bleeding. So, if you draw a diagram like this and represent your answers, then also the examiner knows what you are trying to explain to the examiner and that one slide or one image is representative of the entire answer. Thank you Ankit sir. Thank you for joining the class. I am sure students are awaiting for your psychiatry class as well and uh, thank you for sparing your time and joining for the class. Okay, so I hope everyone's clear about the symptoms that we see in patients with JNA. So, I've told you, you can write it in pointers, you can write it in, uh, you know, a table like this where you're explaining bleeding, obstruction and cranial nerve palsies or you can also draw an image like this to explain your answer. Yeah, so this is what we are going to do. Now, let's go to the signs. What are the signs that we see in JNA? So, the signs that we see in JNA, the first sign is they will have a nasal twang in the voice.
So the signs that we see here is first sign is called as rhinolalia clausa. What is rhinolalia clausa? Can anybody tell me what type of voice? Is it excessive resonance in the voice or less resonance in the voice? What is rhinolalia clausa? Can you all tell me very quickly? I am waiting for your answers in the chat box. What is the meaning of rhinolalia clausa? Okay, and we've already discussed this deformity, which we saw it as frog face deformity. We have explained the signs, which is cranial nerve palsies because of the involvement of the sphenoid sinus and to the cavernous sinus. Now, here comes the trick of representing your answer again in a diagrammatic format. So, you have anterior rhinoscopy. What will you see in anterior rhinoscopy? So, you're going to draw an anterior rhinoscopic image and a posterior rhinoscopic image. Of course, you will see that there is a mass in the nasal cavity which is globular pink and this is going into the nasopharynx obstructing the coina. So, this we are anyways writing it in a simple line. But can we draw it and show it to the examiner that we know it? So, you can draw an anterior rhinoscopic image like this. You can draw the septum, you can draw the turbinates, you can show that there is a mass that is red vascular and it is present in the posterior part of the nose in the nasopharynx. So, you will show that there is a mass, a red vascular mass in the nasopharynx. So, there is a red vascular mass in nasopharynx. So, this is your anterior rhinoscopic image that you are going to draw. Now, what about posterior rhinoscopy? What will you do in posterior rhinoscopy? No, as if uh, whenever there is rhinolalia clausa, it is nasal twang in the voice. Now, we are talking about our voice, so there is less resonance in there is lesser resonance. So, that nasal twang in voice is called as rhinolalia clausa because there is something that is obstructing the nose. Now, if there is something in the nose, it is not going to so we get that nasal twang. That is called as rhinolalia clausa. Okay? Okay, now if we see the posterior rhinoscopic findings, what will we see? In posterior rhinoscopy, you will see something like this. Where you see this is the uvula, this is the eustachian tube, this is the posterior end of the septum and this is the posterior end of the nasal cavity. You see the inferior turbinate posterior end and middle turbinate posterior end. Again, you will see that there will be a mass in the nasopharynx and going to from the coina going to the nasopharynx. So, this is how you are going to represent. Sometimes it may also compress the eustachian tube to cause eustachian tubal obstruction. So, if you can draw all these line diagrams, trust me, trust me, it will come to you in just, uh, you know, you have to practice it one or two times. It's just simple lines that we have drawn. So, it's just going to take you one or two times of practice and trust me, if you do this, you are going to get very good marks in your examination. So, here you are going to show that there is a mass in the coina going to nasopharynx, right? Yes, so this is what you are going to write on anterior rhinoscopy and posterior rhinoscopic findings. So, you can just mention lines like this. Of course, you are going to get half half mark, but this diagram bhi draw kar loge, to of course, you are going to get your gold medal marks. Hai? To gold medal chahiye, to thoda effort lagega, thoda sa energy lagega, but it's all going to be worth it, right? Good. So, Siddhu, uh, pitch ke baare mein nahi hai. This is not about the pitch of the voice. It is the resonance. If there is excessive air in your voice, we call it as a hyper resonant, and if which is called as rhinolalia aperta. But if there is no air, like when a, when we get a cold, when our nose is blocked, we get this nasal twang in the voice. That is called as rhinolalia clausa. ठीक है. So that was about your symptoms and signs. I have clearly differentiated and told you how to represent your symptoms in a flow chart, in the diagrammatic format. I have told you how to represent your signs with bullet points and with diagram. And now it comes to investigation. So when it comes to investigations, they will only check your headings, what you have written in the investigations and treatment. Because management ke liye, there is four marks. They will check investigations may have you written the important things or not. So first will be your diagnostic nasal endoscopy, which will 
will show you that there is a mass in the nasopharynx. CECT is something that you will do that is the investigation of choice. So, what is the investigation of choice? It is a contrast enhanced CT scan. And what are the two signs that we see on a contrast enhanced CT scan? We see a sign called as the Hallman Miller sign and the Hondusa sign. What is Hallman Miller sign? Anterior bowing of posterior wall of maxillary sinus. So, this is our maxillary sinus and there is a tumor behind the maxillary sinus. So, what does this tumor do? This tumor pushes the posterior wall anteriorly and this sign what we see is called as the Hallman Miller sign. Okay, so Hallman Miller sinus, anterior bowing of posterior wall of maxillary sinus, Hondusa sinus, widening of the gap between the maxilla and the mandible. So, between the maxilla and mandible, if there is a widening of the gap, we call that sign as Hondusa sign. Now, when do you do MRI? If there is an intracranial extension or an infratemporal extension or an orbit extension, meaning the tumor has spread. So, to assess, if you don't remember, ye sab kuch, just remember spread samajne ke liye to understand the spread of tumor what we are going to do MRI and angiography why we are doing to understand the vascularity of the tumor. Now you wrote all of this of course you are going to get your two marks here I will agree that that you are going to get two marks over here but there is something that you should always always mention what you should not do in these patients. So what you should never do never never this is what you will write it in bold points. First, you have written investigations may diagnostic nasal endoscopy, CECT, MRI, angiography. Wo to likh diya, usme to do marks a gaye. But you should mention this to get that extra edge or extra point in your exam. So, what should you not do? Never do a probe test. Never do a digital palpation. Never do a FNAC and never do a biopsy. So, no probe test, no digital palpation, no FNAC, no biopsy. These are no's in a patient who has JNA. Why? Because they will bleed excessively and this cannot be controlled. That cannot be controlled. Why it cannot be controlled? Because the blood vessels in JNA lack tunica media. So, since they lack tunica media, the blood vessels cannot contract and since they cannot contract, what will happen? They will have excessive bleeding and that excessive bleeding will be difficult to control. And hence, never do probe test, never do digital palpation, never do FNAC, never do biopsy. So, this is your extra pointer for the exam. Okay, everyone's on with me. Everybody is enjoying the session. If yes, quickly tell me in the chat box that you are all okay with the session, enjoying it well. <coughs> okay, now let us see the surgical treatment. What is the treatment? We of course know that we have to be very careful. So, embolization has to be done first. What is embolization? We block the feeding vessel which is supplying the tumor. So, first you do that block which is called as embolization and followed by that you are going to do surgical excision. So, embolization followed by surgical excision is the treatment of choice for patients with JNA. Now, what are the surgical approaches? It can be, you can remember these names or if you can't remember also, it's still okay. But at the moment, transnasal endoscopic is the best approach but if you can't do the transnasal endoscopic approach then you can go for transpalatine through the palate you can go transpalatine sublabial lateral rhinotomy through the maxilla you can do combined approach maxillary swing operation infratemporal approach all of this can be done so you just need to know this right then you need to understand the treatment part in terms of radiation therapy, hormonal therapy and chemotherapy. When do you give radiation, when do you give hormonal and when do you give chemotherapy. This will be half half marks. Hoga. If you can remember all of this, well and good. If not, it's okay. So, radiation it's given only if the tumor is unresectable or the patient is not fit for surgery or there is an intracranial extension or there is a recurrence, then you give radiation. Hormonal therapy is given as a therapy 
be to reduce the size of tumor or to shrink the size of tumor like diethyl stilbestrone and flutamide other drugs and chemotherapy again is given for aggressive lesions or residual region where they give doxorubicin, vincristine and docarbazine. These are the drugs that we give for patients with chemotherapy. So these will fetch you the another one and a half marks. So we had four marks for treatment. So in four marks for treatment we had to mention about the uh, uh, surgical approaches we had to mention about radiotherapy, hormonal therapy and chemotherapy then you get definitely your three marks plus for your treatment. Okay so okay so that completes your JNA chapter also yes now let's go to Strider chapter and let's see what are the causes of chapter Strider yes thank you Tarun, Siddhu, Mitali, Asif can you all tell me what is the definition of Strider what is the meaning of Strider and here you see definition is given your one mark classification is being given two marks clinical uh, etiology is given three marks and management is given four marks so if you see there are there is a proper distribution because we are talking about competency based medical education and your examination is also going to be in the same format where they're going to discuss to you about practical topics and you need to know practically what are the different things or different points to answer in each of these sessions so when we talk about definition what is the definition of strider so we need to understand what is a strider so strider is basically any abnormally high-pitched harsh noisy breathing very good Shreyas whenever you get an abnormally high-pitched harsh and noisy breathing or respiration because of either partial obstruction or complete obstruction of the airway then we call it as a strider so there is partial obstruction or sometimes in the complete obstruction of your airway which could be the larynx or the tracheobronchial junction then we call it as strider so first you are defining what is the type of sound why is it happening and where is is it happening so these are the three parts of your definition of strider now is it an emergency yes it is an emergency and it requires medical intervention immediately so this will fetch you your one mark that was asked in your examination now they asked you to classify the strider so how do you classify the strider so according to the level of obstruction according to the severity of obstruction so your first heading will be according to the level the second heading will be according to the severity. Now, according to the level of obstruction, it could be your supraglottic strider. It could be your tracheobronchial strider. It could be your subglottic strider. Now, if you want to diagrammatically represent this, you can also diagrammatically represent this in this format where you draw the upper airway and the lower airway. So you can draw this as the larynx, this is your trachea and from here you have your bronchus, right? So any obstruction that happens above the level of vocal cords, this is going to be your supraglottic strider. Okay, so anything above the level of vocal cords is going to be your supraglottic. Anything from your thoracic trachea, not the part of trachea that is in your neck, from the thoracic trachea and your bronchus is going to be your tracheobronchial strider. And anything in between here, this portion, the vocal cords, subglottis and the cervical trachea this part we call it as subglottic strider so you can write in terms of terminology ki what is supraglottic what is subglottic and what is tracheobronchial the definition which we have just discussed supraglottic any lesion above the vocal cord supraglottis and glottis any lesion involving the distal trachea and bronchi is tracheobronchial and any lesion between the subglottis and the proximal trachea is your subglottic strider so you can write definition but i would recommend you to draw this diagram to get the examiner in one vision to understand that you know what is the meaning of the three uh, levels of strider now according to the severity how do you classify the strider you classify it as mild or moderate or severe strider so what is mild strider mild strider is the patient is having strider on 
unaccustomed exertion meaning the patient is doing exercise or some sort of physical event that is tiring him so on exertion if you get a strider it is called as mild strider what is moderate strider if it is on minimal exertion not on unaccustomed exertion but on very minimal exertion the patient is not doing any unaccustomed activity but on minimal exertion we call it as milder moderate type of strider but if there is strider even at rest then we call it as severe strider so this is how you classify the strider based upon severity so we classify strider based upon two types upon the location and upon the severity so location supraglottic or uh, subglottic or the tracheobronchial and based upon the severity it could be mild it could be moderate and it could be severe right so i hope everybody got this now let's understand the etiology of strider now whenever it comes to etiology when you want to write an etiology for any question let me give you a quick trick for all of you so when it comes to any etiology kuch bhi yaad nahi aa raha exam mein ki kya likhe iska etiology try and put those uh, the causes into the following subheadings uske liye ek mnemonic hai which is vitamin c theek hai सो so, कुछ भी याद नहीं आ रहा है स्ट्राइडर का चैप्टर छोड़ दो कोई भी क्वेश्चन पूछा गया है जिसमें दे आर आस्किंग यू एनी क्वेश्चन एंड देर आस्किंग यू इटियोलॉजी एंड यू आर हार्डली एबल टू रिकॉल एनीथिंग अबाउट इट सो जस्ट राइट वाइटामिन सी सो सी इफ देर इज एनी वैस्क्यूलर कॉज दैट इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द करेंट कंडीशन can vascular cause cause strider yes i can think of aortic aneurysm there could be uh, you know any blood vessels that are impending or they are pressing on to the airway can that cause a hematoma of the thyroid after thyroid surgery can it cause strider yes so i will think of all the probable vascular pathologies that can cause strider and if it is any other cause we'll think about any other vascular abnormalities are they responsible for that disease now i could be infective now we know most of the causes are due to infection so infection se ho raha hai ya nahi hai wo dekh sakte for now if for example if i think about strider which infections can cause strider typically pediatric emergencies mein humne dekha hai epiglottitis croup there are two infective conditions where we know there could be strider epiglottitis is caused by streptococcus pneumonia croup is caused because of para influenza type 1 and type 2 so you can remember it that way what is c t traumatic ट्रॉमा से होगा स्ट्राइडर हाँ होगा इफ देर इज अट्रेंगुलेशन ऑफ नेक कट थ्रोट इंजरी और वेन यू आर डूइंग प्रोसीजर फॉर थाइरॉइड सर्जरी एंड यू डिड एक्सीडेंटल इंजुरी टू दी ट्रैक किया और इफ देर इज अल रिसेक्शन सो एनी ट्रॉमा टू द नेक कैन इट कॉज स्ट्राइडर यस नाउ ए एज फॉर ऑटो इम्यून any autoimmune diseases responsible for strider less often but for other diseases whichever they have asked you in exam you can attribute any autoimmune causes m m is for metabolic so is there any metabolic derangement that is responsible for the causation of disease yes i i is for again infective you can take infective you can take inflammatory both of these are overlap conditions so non infective inflammatory lesions can also cause uh, you know diseases so inflammatory lesions can cause n is for neoplastic and c is for congenital so this way if you try to divide your headings for etiology of any cause matlab etiology pucha hai kuch bhi yaad nahi aa raha ye headings likho aur try karo ki isme kahin pe fit ho raha hai you will be able to write at least for one or two marks and get your answers there so it could be congenital because of laryngomalacia subglottic stenosis inflammatory epiglottitis croup traumatic intubation birth injury foreign body it could be neoplastic it could be allergic these are the different causes of strider so i have told you already the shortcut of how to understand the causes for strider theek hai now how what is the how do you investigate and treat first of all you have to see the history the time of presentation how did the patient present it is congenital or acquired should be a first question then the progression of the disease then you need to know the duration is there any history of aspiration history of any endoscopy or intubation and history of any foreign body this is all that you are going to look for in the history now clinical examination you will look for specifically is there any use of accessory muscles of respiration is there any ret retraction or recession in the suprasternal notch in the sternum in the intercostal spaces in the epigastric is there any recession that is telling to you that there is a forceful or an effortful breathing 
check if the strider is inspiratory expiratory or biphasic because this will tell you the level of obstruction any supraglottic strider will cause inspiratory uh, is inspiratory anything that is tracheobronchial is biphasic and anything in between is going to be your um, by um, sorry the trachea the thoracic trachea and the bronchus will cause expiratory strider anything above the vocal cords will cause inspiratory strider and in between will cause you biphasic strider so this is something that you should look for and you should examine the oral cavity oropharynx nasopharynx larynx hypopharynx you must look for look for signs of trauma and observe if there is any positional change that will improve the strider because in prone position there is improvement in strider in laryngomalacia so look for these features then you will investigate always get an x-ray to rule out any foreign body or if there is any emphysema or if there is any trauma so x-ray of the neck x-ray of the chest x-ray of the abdomen is something that you will do barium swallow is done to understand if there is any malignancies of the hypopharynx and the esophagus then you will do angiography to understand if there is any vascular anomalies CECT is done from skull base to the mediastinum to see if anywhere there is an obstructive pathology, inflammatory pathology, neoplastic pathology responsible for the strider. MRI is done to understand if there is any lesion in the mediastinum and you should do a bronchoscopic examination to see the patency of the airway and if there is anywhere a compromise of the airway. Shreyas, uh, the reference book that I would say for sure would be your uh, Dhingra but yes there are other books which you can take like Hazarika of course is a very nice book. So basic reference book would be Dhingra and uh, having said that you should prepare how to represent your answers because this is something that will come with practice. It will not happen that in your exam you know what I have to write. You have to plan your answers in a particular way. You have to take your PYQ questions, note down how the questions have come. If this question comes or if a similar question comes how will I represent my answers that is what is going to make a difference between you and the others and that is what exactly I am trying to showcase over here because I can teach you the entire ENT over the period of few hours but what matters is how you are going to get your examination marks that is why we have this last resort revision happening over here. Yes. So, what is the treatment? Initial therapy, you will give oxygen supplementation, steroids and bronchodilators. Endotracheal intubation if it is necessary because if a patient is having strider at rest, you can't wait for him to go into respiratory acidosis alkalosis or metabolic acidosis alkalosis. You don't want him to go into uh, death. So, you will do that. As an emergency, you can do cricothyrotomy or a tracheostomy. So, initial therapy will always be oxygen supplementation. Give steroids give bronchodilators intubate the patient or do cricothyrotomy or do a tracheostomy so if you write this much and in this particular format and in a particular order you are bound to get definitely your answers and your marks right in your exams so with this we have finished four important long essays i would like to know do you guys want me to continue further or you want me to break the class here because it's almost two hours now are you all in with me for further class because we have long essays another three questions and then we have short essays for further discussion if you want me to break and do it again in another session we can go ahead and do another session if you guys are uh, feeling tired then we can take a break if you guys are okay then we might continue so just let me know in the chat box what should we do next so we will see what is the next question meanwhile till I get your answers classify tonsillectomy what are the indications contraindications positions and complications so let me know what you're feeling what you guys are up to Yes, I am waiting. Siddhu, what do you mean by yes? You want me to continue or you want me to uh, break the class and do another session forward? Yes, I am waiting for your answers. Okay, so let's continue because I'm seeing that only Siddhu is messaging and responding while others are not. So we will continue. Okay, so let's do one thing. We'll finish the long questions. Uh, 
yes we will finish the long questions and then before we start the short essays we will take a break and i maybe i can schedule another class with the team and we can do the short essays at one go because there are about 20 questions in the short essays that we need to discuss so once we finish the long essays we will go to the short essays on a later time okay so let's see the classification of methods of tonsillectomy so if you see the tonsillectomy there is cold method and hot method today the hot methods are becoming more famous than cold methods so we will classify tonsillectomy me as a cold method tonsillectomy and a hot method tonsillectomy so this will be your first subheading cold method the second subheading will be hot so in cold methods what are the two types the first type is your dissection and snare type and the second one is your guillotine type the third one is cryosurgical technique and the fourth one is intracapsular tonsillectomy so if you see there are four types in this we have got the first one which is the dissection and snare type the second one is your guillotine method. The third one is going to be your cryosurgery. And the fourth one is going to be your intracapsular tonsillectomy. So basically dissection and snare technique involves dissecting the tonsil from the bed with the help of tonsillar dissector. And when it comes to the lower pole, you're going to put your snail and snare and crush and get the tonsil out that is going to be your dissection and snare guillotine technique basically a guillotine it is like your crusher you just hold it across the tonsil and cut it it is not performed nowadays dissection and snare can still be performed cryosurgical technique basically here we use a cryo probe so this cryo probe will have like you know extreme cold temperatures of minus 18 minus 20 degrees celsius this will cause necrosis of the tonsil from the tonsillar bed and that is how the tonsil will fall off because there is thrombosis of the vessels and because of thrombosis there will be less bleeding after surgery as you compare with any of the other methods and intracapsular tonsillectomy involves removal of the tonsil with the help of a debrider which will keep the capsule intact and helps to remove the tonsil so these are the four methods which we call it as uh, you know your cold methods of course we have got harmonic scalpel and coblation technology which are newer methods i would not classify them into completely cold or completely hot you could put them into intermediate what is intermediate this is low heat not a high heat generated this is a low heat generated at the type of at the level of the tissue so here we use harmonic scalpel for cutting and coagulating the tissue as a result it will cause lesser pain coagulation technology involves using a wand that will help in cutting and coagulating and here since we run normal saline through the electrodes again the amount of tissue injury is going to be extremely minimal but what are the hot methods? Hot methods is involving cautery where you will use bipolar electrocautery. You can use laser like KTP laser or carbon dioxide laser. We can have partial tonsillotomy done uh, when general anesthesia is contraindicated and radio frequency where again we will use uh, you know heat to destroy the cells which are present and that will cause destruction of the tissue of the tonsil. Now that was about the hot methods and about the cold methods and the intermediate heat methods of performing tonsillectomy. What are the absolute indication of tonsillectomy? Now there were different indications that were given before but today's indications have changed. So if you see your book you will see what was mentioned in the slide but if you were asked indications of tonsillectomy how will you write? the indications of tonsillectomy you will write it into a tabular form describing absolute indications and relative indications so the absolute indication for performing tonsillectomy is if a child has enlarged tonsil with obstructive sleep apnea so there is an enlarged tonsil with obstructive sleep apnea that is an absolute indication the second absolute indication for performing a tonsillectomy is if there is a malignancy of the tonsil so this is your absolute indication of performing a tonsillectomy these are the only two absolute indication the rest of all the other indications which were given like recurrent tonsillitis chronic tonsillitis or if the tonsillitis is causing rheumatic fever subacute bacterial endocarditis if there is second episode of quincy which is nothing but peritonsillar abscess or as a part of other surgeries like styloid excision 
or uvulopalatopharyngoplasty. All of these are relative indications of performing tonsillectomy. They are not the absolute, they are relative indications. What is the definition of recurrent tonsillitis? You can remind, you can remember it with the number 753123. So, what is 753123? 3? 7 or more episodes of tonsillitis in 1 year, 5 or more episodes in 2 years, and 3 or more episodes in 3 consecutive years. Then we say that it is a recurrent tonsillitis. What is chronic tonsillitis? If the disease of duration is of more than 3 months, then we say that it is a chronic tonsillitis. Why is there rheumatic fever, subacute bacterial endocarditis or glomerular nephritis? Because tonsil has the focus of infection which is your uh, streptococcus and this streptococcus is beta hemolytic type of streptococcus which has got cross reactive antigen against myocardium, glomerulus and kidneys and as a result they can have this um, rheumatic fever, subacute bacterial endocarditis. What is quincy? It is peritonsillar abscess. So, if there is a second episode of peritonsillar abscess, it is not wise to keep the source of infection in the tonsil. It, you must actually remove it. And as a part of other surgery like styloid excision and P, you can do a tonsillectomy. So, if you see here, all of this peritonsillar abscess, recurrent infections, they are but they are not absolute indications, they are relative indications. But OSA is an absolute indication indication and malignancy is an absolute indication for performing tonsillectomy. Again, the other car diphtheria carriers, streptococcal carriers, if they have halitosis, if they have recurrent streptococcal tonsillitis with a heart disease, all of these are relative indications. What are the contraindications when you should not perform a tonsillectomy if there is a hemoglobin level of less than 10 grams, acute tonsillitis, acute URTI if the child is less than 3 years of age, if there is a submucosal cleft palate, bleeding and clotting disorders, epidemic of polio and if there is an uncontrolled systemic disease. Of course, any infection, any coagulation disorder, if there is a uh, epidemic of any infection happening, you cannot do a tonsillectomy at all. So, these are some contraindications of when you cannot do a tonsillectomy. Now, what is the position? Everyone knows the name given to the position is called as rose position, where the patient lies with neck extended with uh, pillows or shoulder rolls kept under the shoulders and the head is stabilized with the ring. So, there is a uh, extension at the neck and extension at the atlanto occipital joint. So, you can draw your diagram also like this. So, you can put here a log below the patient's shoulder. Yes, so you can represent your diagram like this. So, there is a shoulder back under the shoulder. So, there is extension at the neck and extension at atlanto axial joint. So, atlanto axial joint you have extension. So, extension at two places. So, this is how you are going to draw your answer and explain your rows position. So, extension of the neck and extension at the atlanto axial joint you should mention for rows position. What are the complications? First is primary hemorrhage which happens on the table, operating table. You will manage it by applying pressure or cauterize the bleeding vessel or ligate the bleeding vessel, one of the two. The next one you are going to do is reactionary hemorrhage. Reactionary hemorrhage is within 24 hours of surgery, then you call it as reactionary hemorrhage. Now, how do you manage this? Your, if it is not controlled with pressure, you have to take the patient under GA and ligate the bleeding vessel. Now, there could be secondary hemorrhage which happens after 24 hours but up till 14 days which is called as secondary hemorrhage. So, that secondary hemorrhage is due to infection. So, we have primary, we have got reactionary and we have got secondary hemorrhage. Now, along with this, when we are putting the mouth gag, can we cause injury to teeth, injury to lips, injury to tongue? Can there be aspiration if you have not put a throat back? Can there be facial edema because of uh, air leak and can there be surgical emphysema? Yes. So, these are all the other complications that can happen. Delayed complication, I have already told you secondary hemorrhage up till 14 days, you can have infection causing the secondary hemorrhage, lung complication like lung abscesses, scarring of the soft palate and there can be remnants of the tonsil and there can be lingual tonsillar hypertrophy. So, these are all the delayed complications that can happen. So, we have acute complications in the form of primary and reactionary hemorrhage with injury to various structures which we are operating upon and the 
later we can have delayed complications where we can have lung abscesses, scarring, we can have secondary hemorrhage, we can have remnants that can be left back and that can be hypertrophy of the lingual tonsil. Okay, so that completes your tonsillectomy. We described the methods of tonsillectomy. We described the position of tonsillectomy. We, in, uh, we uh, went into indications. We went into contraindications and we discussed the complications. So that was continuously about what are the types of tonsillectomy. Then we have got the next question on glomus tumors. What are the types of glomus tumor? What are the clinical features? What is the investigation and treatment? So basically for classification purposes, if we have to we have to uh, tell what are the types of glomus we have got glomus tympanicum and then we have got glomus jugular so we have glomus tympanicum and we have got glomus jugular right so what is glomus tympanicum it is the tumor originating from the promontory so this is your promontory so from the promontory if you have a tumor originating we call it as glomus tympanicum where exactly from the promontory from the tympanic plexus which covers the promontory so tympanic plexus is a plexus formed by glossopharyngeal nerve and sympathetic plexus around the carotid which forms a plexus we call it as glomus tympanicum and if we have a tumor originating from this tympanic plexus we call it as glomus tympanicum what is glomus jugular if there is a tumor originating from the jugular bulb we call it as glomus jugular. So, if it comes from the jugular, we call it as glomus jugular. If it comes from glomus, uh, if it comes from the tympanic plexus which covers the promontory, then we call it as glomus jugular. Okay. So, we can have other types of glomus as well. Glomus vagal which extends from the, which is arising high from the vagal ganglion in the neck and extends up to jugular foramen. But typically, if we have to discuss, there are two types. Now, there is classification given by fish where we say type A tumor, it is localized only to the middle ear. Type B tumors where it is tympanomastoid meaning middle ear and mastoid is involved. Type C tumor is infralabyrinthine extension and type D is intracranial extension. So, if it is located to only middle ear, we call it as type A. Middle ear and mastoid, it is type B. If it is going infralabyrinthine type C and if it is going intracranial, we call it as type D. So, what are the clinical features in a patient with glomus? We know that this tumor is located in the middle ear. So, we know that there is a lesion that is located in the middle ear. It could be either from the promontory which we call it as glomus tympanicum or it could be from the jugular which we call it as glomus jugular. So, there is a slow growing mass in the middle ear. So, they will have a gradually progressive conductive type of a hearing loss because there is a mass middle, arising in the middle ear. What type of hearing loss? It is in the conductive pathway. So, you will have a conductive type of hearing loss. Now, there will be tinnitus that resembles your heartbeat. So, this is something very important that there is a tinnitus that resembles the heartbeat. You will have a blocking or fullness in the ear. They will have sometimes bleeding from the ear as well. Again, these tumors lack tunica media. So, since the tumors lack tunica media, they will cause bleeding symptoms. And hence, again, here there is no probe test, there is no digital palpation, there is no FNAC, there is no biopsy. They will have again dizziness and vertigo if it is causing involvement of the inner ear. Now, they can have facial palsy, they can have otalgia, they can have dysphagia, hoarseness based upon the extension. So, here you can show the symptoms after extension of the disease. So, you can classify the symptoms when localized to the middle ear and when it is spreading. When localized to the middle ear, we have already discussed gradually progressive conductive hearing loss, fullness in the ear, pulsatile tinnitus and bleeding. That is what is when the disease is located to the middle ear. Now, if the disease spreads from the middle ear, superiorly it can go to the middle cranial fossa and it can affect the temporal lobe of the brain. So, spread can go to the temporal lobe of the brain and that can be involved. The disease can go from the middle ear to the inner ear and if it goes to the inner ear, the patient can have vertigo, the patient can have sensory neural hearing loss. Now, if it goes inferiorly towards the jugular foramen, 
we know that jugular bulb it is originating so if it goes to the jugular foramen it can involve 9th 10th and 11th cranial nerves resulting in swallowing and speech defects so swallowing and speech defects if it goes laterally it can go to the external ear and present as a bleeding mass of the external ear so based upon the extension of the tumor if it goes superiorly middle cranial fossa medially inner ear inferiorly jugular foramen laterally to the external ear we can have associated symptoms as well so these are the symptoms that we can describe when it is localized to the middle ear when it spreads what are the other symptoms that the patient can experience now sign is something that we are going to see very specifically in this tumor the otoscopy will show you a rising sun appearance so again you can draw a diagram to describe all of this so if you want to write the signs you can write like how i have mentioned in the previous slide or you can go ahead to draw something like this so you can show that there is a red pulsatile mass that is present in the middle ear and through the tympanic membrane you can see this reddish reflex. So this red reflex that you see is called as rising sun appearance. So what is this appearance called as rising sun appearance. So red reflex in the floor. So you see a red reflex in near the floor of middle ear through the tympanic membrane now you can see this as your first sign you can have the second sign what is the second sign which is called as your brown sign what is brown sign you keep a seagull's pneumatic speculum and you increase the pressure in the external auditory canal what would happen the tumor will vibrate vigorously and then it will become pale so what is brown sign in, in on increasing the pressure in external auditory canal the tumor will vibrate vigorously and then become pale so that sign is called as brown sign then we have got a third sign which is called as the aquino sign so what is aquino sign on compressing the carotid the tumor becomes pale that sign is called as aquino sign so what is aquino sign carotid compression makes the tumor pale so that sign is called as aquino sign then we have bleeding that can be present and this is going to profusely bleed you can also feel an audible brew especially because it's coming from the vascular plexus you can always hear that audible brew but these are the three important signs clinical signs that you're going to mention in your answer sheet of course we have radiological signs that we see on ct on mri but these three clinical signs you should mention now there is a rule of 10 with glomus tumor what is that rule of 10 10 percent of them are familial 10 percent of them are multicentric and 10 percent of them secrete catecholamines what are the investigations for patients with glomus of course we are going to look for catecholamine excess we are going to do an audiogram which is going to show us conductive hearing loss but the investigation of choice is going to be a carotid uh, is going to be a ct scan on ct scan we see a sign and that sign is called as phelps sign so what is phelps sign it is erosion of the carotico jugular spine so if there is erosion of carotico jugular spine on the ct scan that we call it as phelps sign mri is also going to be done mri is going to show you some specific appearance which is called as salt and pepper appearance four vessel angiography is done to identify the feeding tumor to the uh, tube feeding blood vessel to the tumor and also understand how much is the perfusion to the brain sometimes you can do xenon which is a radio isotope study to understand the risk of stroke because when you are operating sometimes you can cause ICA injury and that can predispose the patient to stroke now how do you remove what is the treatment part you are going to do embolization and do surgical excision surgical excision can be either through trans canal trans mastoid facial recess infratemporal or trans condylar you don't need to know the details of the approach you just need to know the names if you know the names that's more than enough for your answer in your exam and along with that radiation for inoperable tumors residual tumor or if there is recurrence or elderly patients then we are going to do this so embolization has to be done followed by embolization we are going to do a surgical excision
So with this, we finish our long essays and the next ones are all our short essays. So I hope all of you enjoyed this session with me and you understood about how to represent your answers and how to go ahead. So first and foremost, before I conclude my session for today, always, always prepare your answers beforehand. You cannot have your answer representation happening during the exam. You need to prepare what are my points for this particular topic, what are my diagrams that I will draw. Practice the diagrams that you are going to draw in your exam previously because your hand will move in continuity only if you have had the practice. Otherwise, it will not come. Second most important thing, do an active recall. What is the meaning of active recall? Whenever you are studying something, when you have studied a chapter, close the eyes, think about the chapter, always start from what is it, what is it, meaning what is this chapter about, then what is the etiology of this chapter, what are the, what is the pathophysiology of the disease, then what is the symptoms, what is the science? How do we establish diagnosis? How do we treat? So for every chapter, you are going to mentally prepare and think on all these lines and that is when you are going to do an active recall. And number three, go to your previous year questions and plan your answers for all the previous year questions. And most of the times you will see many questions repeating in a similar or a little bit different format, but you at least are prepared on how to answer the questions. And last but not or not the least, you need to have confidence confidence in yourself that even if you don't know anything in the examination you will still attempt the answer and come because you know something about that chapter and you're not going to miss the exam question just because you forgot everything but you just remember something take that something and build up your answer on that something that you know so be confident so with this uh, yeah, so with this, we will uh, stop the discussion for now and we will continue the, uh, the next part of the session in the next, uh, you know, the next half on an another date. We will take a date very soon and get you informed. Do like, share and subscribe to the channel to uh, get a notification of when and uh, whatever classes will happen. Trust me, this source is very reliable for all of you. All the teachers are putting in a lot of effort to get you the content in the most concise format and the most uh, uh, you know useful format that will help you get the maximum marks in your university examinations okay so uh, fine then I will take your uh, leave for now and uh, yes uh, Sidhu we will have next discussion of all the questions in the next class because it's almost two hours now so we will take a quick break and we will take a time on another date and we will I will come back on another date and time to do the next part of the session okay so take care guys I will see you another time bye bye and if you like and if you've got any other questions please do mention in the chat box below. So thank you everyone take care bye bye.